everyone. Remember this time last year? How many of you were here? What a difference a year makes. Well, many of you know uh, I was in banking for 32 years. And just this past year, I helped expand a new bank into Pensacola. You may not have heard about them, but they're also a sponsor tonight. Gulf South Private Bank. Four years ago, a group of investors in Destin, Florida, decided they needed a hometown personal private bank. So four years ago, Gulf South Private Bank started in Destin, Florida, and I am very pleased to expand Gulf South Private Bank into the Pensacola area. Have a wonderful staff. Some are here. I will show you. This is our Destin office. Uh, this We don't quite have the office here. We're the fifth branch um, of the group, but this is the Destin office when you go down 98. This was our ribbon cutting. We're in Madison Park, 4300 Bayou Boulevard. Um, the bank is downstairs and Carlin Consulting is upstairs. I tell people now, I can bring my dog and my husband to work with me. <laughs> and this is my great staff here uh, in the Pensacola market, Sarah Daniel, Amanda Short, and Tanya Estes. And I would love for all of you to come by and visit. And of course, Carlin Consulting opened in 07 when I left the banking industry and we're excited to be doing seminars, coaching seminars within corporations. And uh, just yesterday, we did uh, a DRIP seminar with Chuck Carlson. I do seminars around health, wealth, and happiness. And this month, we're concentrating on wealth. And we're expanding that through a community called Our Collective Mind. And you will see a website on that soon. But let's talk about what we're here. A year ago, let's set the stage. How did you feel? A year ago, there was a lot of doubt, fear, and anxiety. And I can say in my 32 years uh, in the financial services industry, I was quite nervous. Well, I asked Chuck to come down and speak to our group. And I want to tell you these lecture series, I want to thank Dr. Ford. I'm on the board. But Dr. Ford brought these lecture series to Pensacola. And I would encourage any of you to step up. We want to keep these. Um, seminars free. Uh, they're of great value and we love for other sponsors to step up in 2010 and help us bring other just fabulous people to our area. Uh, they're of great value. But let's think about last year. A lot of, we just had a new president brought into office and we decided to bring Chuck down. I think we were all looking for any glimmer of hope. Chuck's on the way down and within two days the market drops 850 points. And, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I want this guy to come. I think he, you know, there's something connected to Chuck in the market. So uh, anyway, Chuck made a lot of predictions. And so Chuck, you know, you made some predictions last year. So I, I want you to rehash those and tell us how they've turned out. Chuck Carlson. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Dr. Ford and IHMC for having me back. It's... Uh, how many people came last year? I don't really know what to make from that, actually. There aren't that <laughs> I'd like to have seen more hands, actually, but that's okay. Um, as Carol mentioned, I was here last year, and the market promptly fell 850 points. I came this year, and you promptly had a tropical storm. <laughs> I won't come next year. I can pretty well guarantee that. Uh, as Carol mentioned, you have the rare... Um, opportunity to kind of dissect what somebody in my shoes told you a year ago because uh, IHMC puts the seminar topics up on the website for people to see. And I'm sure some of you probably did take a look at what I said last year and my prognostications and how accurate I was. But I thought I would pull some snippets from last year just to show you. And I think I was pretty good. But keep in mind now, what I'm about to show you is from my talk last year. Uh, you're going to know that because I have something written in the upper right-hand corner that says it was from last year and Chuck's predictions. Uh, I will caution you that I did get some very interesting questions last year in the Q&A, so uh, let's see how I did. Yes, what will the market be one year from now? I think the Dow Jones Industrial Average will be 10,200 exactly one year from today.
That's pretty good. The Dow closed today, by the way, at 10,197. So I wasn't exactly right, but that's pretty good. Let's see what else I had here. Let me see. What stocks will be taken over in 2009? Good question. I think you're going to see Burlington Northern acquired by Warren Buffett. It's pretty good. That's pretty good. They start getting a little weirder now, though. Okay, the questions were not what I would have expected. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Best Picture Oscar for 2009. Curious case of Benjamin Button, Slumdog Millionaire. I'm going to go with Slumdog Millionaire. That was Slumdog Millionaire, actually. They get a little weirder still. Where will the Olympics be held in 2016? Well, if you live in Chicago, I wouldn't get too cozy. Why? Blame it on Rio. That's right on. World Series? Yankees in six. Sorry, Philly. And I'm, a from, I'm from outside of Philadelphia, so that one hurt. I know this is kind of a crazy prediction, but I think you're going to see a successful water landing in the Hudson in 2009. That might be my best prediction of all of them, all right? I have to admit, that's an odd question. What celebrities will die in 2009? Hmm. At the top of my list are Billy Mays and, of course, Michael Jackson. All right, it was on the edge there. I, that almost didn't make it. We have one more. Last question. Yes. Will there be a tropical storm in Pensacola in, in 2009? In November? What are you, crazy? So, all right, I got one wrong there. So, as Carl mentioned, my name is Chuck Carlson. I wear two hats. I work for a firm called Horizon Publishing, which publishes investment newsletters. And our firm has been publishing investment newsletters since 1946. Uh, I'm one of those rarities. I've been there since uh, it's the only job I've ever had. I've been there for 27 years. One of our newsletters uh, is a newsletter that we've probably pummeled many of you in this room with a thousand solicitations. It's called Dow Theory Forecast, which is one of the oldest uh, and most widely read investment newsletters in the country. Another hat that I wear is I'm also CEO of Horizon Investment Services, which manages money for individuals. Uh, tonight, what I'm going to talk to you about uh, is the market. Um, mentioned, uh, uh, Carol mentioned last year when I was here Things weren't so good. Basically, on November 20th is when I spoke last year. You had a Dow Jones Industrial Average, which was right around 7,500, that had fallen all the way from about 14,000 in October of 2000, uh, 2007. Uh, 13,000 here. So from May of 08 to basically November in that seven-month period, you had a Dow that basically got cut in half. Um, same on the transports here, even more dramatic on the transports. So it was really rough time. What I'm trying to talk to you tonight about is what's happened since then and why, and I'll get to that slide in a moment, what I think is going to happen going forward. And my aim is to really provide you with some perspective. You know, people in my shoes, you know, it's foolish for us to get up here and say we're going to get it exactly right. We're not. Um, you know, we're human too. But I think as an investor, the best you can hope for is to have some relative idea or perspective of where you are in terms of risk in the marketplace. And I'm going to go over two tools that my firm uses to try to get some assessment of the risk in the marketplace. Uh, after I go through those two tools, then I'll get to the part that everybody always wants to get to, and that's the stock recommendations. You know, I've done this so long, it's like, you know, you can hear the snoring for the first part, and then it's, here come the stock recommendations, and the paper comes out. So, we're going to get to that here in a moment. But, this is what happened last year. And again, the reasons for this, you know, we talked about last year, it was basically you had a massive deleveraging in the financial system, a deleveraging or selling, just sell, sell, sell everything that moved. And part of the reason for that and the catalyst for that really was the implosion in the housing market. A lot of things happened with that implosion in the housing market. You had individuals that were basically using the home equity uh, as their own personal piggy banks, and that was funding consumer spending. When that game stopped, so did the consumer spending stop. You had these mortgage securities that were written on all this stuff that were repackaged and sent out across the world. 
and those securities started to go bad and started to really hammer balance sheets of banks and other financial institutions. That forced them to have to raise capital, have forced them to call in debt. You had investors on margin that were getting margin calls as the market continued to decline, forcing them to sell, sell, sell. And the way you knew that was, again, when you looked and saw the declines in virtually every asset class last year, you know, stocks were down 35 to 40 percent. International stocks were down 45 to 50 percent. Some bonds were down 20 to 25 percent. Commodities were down. The only security class last year that showed any kind of a gain was what? It was really treasury securities, you know, the safest thing you could be in. And that's what was hammering this down. Now, at the time last year, I said, you know, I don't know if this thing is going to bottom. But I can tell you there are some indications why I think this is probably a pretty good time to start to put some money into the market. And actually, that turned out to be not such a, a bad suggestion. Interestingly, however, if you look, as bad as things were in November, when the market bottomed right here, we had this rally in January up to about 9,000, and then what happened? Boom. Down to 6,500. So, had you taken my advice at that time and started to put some money back into the market here, you, you, you got a little bit of a hey, and then you got a no and got crushed right here. But you're pretty glad you did, given what's happened since March. We've had a move in the market since March of about 50%. Why? Well, again, one of the tools that we use to try to get an assessment of what can go on in the market is this thing called the Dow Theory. The Dow Theory, you know, we call our newsletter Dow Theory Forecast because we follow this. The Dow Theory was developed by a fellow named Charles Dow, who was the first publisher of the Wall Street Journal back in the previous century, in the 1890s. And Charles Dow's aim was really to try to develop a way to get some picture, some window into the economy. And he felt by using the performance of two indices, first the Dow Jones, at that time the Dow Jones Railroad Index, which actually was the first index that later became the Dow Jones Transportation Average, and then the Dow Jones Industrial Average, by looking at those two indices, you could get some insight into market movements. The, the fundamentals behind that were basically the industrials make stuff and the transport ship stuff. And you kind of need those two things in sync in order for the economy to kind of be in sync. The Dow theory is pretty clear on what you can expect after significant market declines like this, and it quantifies that. It says basically when you have a market that has this type of decline, generally speaking, the rebound is going to retrace about one-third to two-thirds of this decline. So as crazy as this market rally has seemed, under the Dow theory, it actually has been quite normal. You had a move here, if you use the May high of about 13,000, down to 6,500, you had a drop in the market of about 6,500 points. A one-third to two-thirds retracement of that would be, a two-thirds would be about 4,500 points to 4,600 points, something like that. When you tack 4,500 points onto 6,500, that gets you at about 11,000. So, if somebody asks me, where do I think this market can go in the short run, you know, I think a kind of a good upper limit to be using from an investor standpoint is probably somewhere around the 11,000 level. Now, does it have to go to 11,000? Can it start to, to pull back at this level? The answer is sure, it can. But if you're trying to get, again, we're talking about getting a perspective, trying to get some sense about what can happen in this market based on a tool that, you know, we've been using since 1946 and has been around since the 1890s, the Dow Theory is a pretty good track record. It's not perfect. No market tool is. But it's a pretty good track record. And, and again, under the Dow Theory, what has been happening, as robust as this rally has seemed, both in the industrials as well as transports, it has still been well within expectations of the Dow Theory. Now, what has really driven this rally as much as anything? Well, first off, we didn't fall into the abyss. You know, the world didn't end. And when I came here last year in November, um, probably half the audience was, you know, thinking, this is it. And unfortunately, probably that half got out of the market right here. I can't take it anymore. I'm going to get out. What we've seen, obviously, is, is a nice bounce back. Uh, there are a number of factors driving this bounce back. I think one of the biggest factors, quite honestly, 
is there's a ton of cash out there. There's $4 trillion in money markets at the beginning of this year. $4 trillion. Now, when the markets were cascading like this, nobody cared that with that cash, they were getting pretty much nothing on it at their bank. And there was a period in here, believe it or not, when people were getting willing now, willing, because they didn't want to lose any more money in the stock market, to take a negative return out on a treasury security. They were willing to buy a treasury security at about 100 cents on the dollar, um, knowing they were going to get back about 98 and a half. That's how bad things got, but that's not real rational, is it? Unless we are going into the end of time, that's really not that rational to think that. And as it turned out, it really wasn't. But you had people thinking that. But now, once the market indicated we weren't going into the abyss, we weren't going to die, you know, everything wasn't going to necessarily turn out great, but life was going to go on, people started to examine and said, you know what, I can't make, I can't live on 0.09% on that money market account. I can't live on 0.05% that I'm earning in that sweep account at my broker. I've got to find more return for that money. So consequently, what happened? You started to see this shift of money back into not just stocks, but bonds, gold, virtually every asset class. And that's a powerful force when you're talking about moving, you know, having $4 trillion on the sidelines that starts coming into securities and assets, it starts driving things up. And again, if I had a chart up here of fixed income investments, I mean, high yield bonds are up 25 to 30% this year in some cases. Gold has done very well this year. Stocks have done very well this year. Just as you had this huge selling going on here, driving virtually every asset class down because of this tightening in effect liquidity, you've had this increased liquidity coming into the market, not just driven by the, the increased liquidity provided by the government, but also people taking that money off the sidelines. Now, how high can this go? Well, I think you know, 11,000 is what I'm looking at, but boy, you still have a ton of mo money coming into the market. And let me ask you this, let me show a hint. Who thinks the market can go significantly higher from here? So I presume the rest of you think it, it probably can't. Um, notice there wasn't a real consensus there. And I think from an investment standpoint, that's interesting. I, can, I really get nervous about trends in the market when virtually everybody thinks that they're going to continue. And I think there's still a fair amount of skepticism that this rally can continue. Quite honestly, if I'd have given this talk a month ago, I would have been saying the same thing I am now. I don't think this market's going to go too much higher, but it's, it's, it has. Uh, and, you know, you have an awful lot of hedge funds, mutual fund managers, people who do what I do. It's getting close to the end of the year. They're trying to keep up their performance with benchmarks. They don't want to get caught with their pants down and have too much cash. So consequently, what are they doing? Well, there's a lot of, what do they call them, skeptical bulls out there where, and you read it all the time in the Wall Street Journal. I read it one coming down on the airplane, and the guy made this, you know, four-paragraph reason why the market's going to go down, and in the fifth paragraph, but we're putting money into the market because it seems like it keeps going up. Well, I don't know if that's the most sound foundation for buying stocks, but trust me, a lot of people do that. Um, the other things we have had here, and it is worth noting, is that ultimately stocks are driven really by three things. There's three engines of stock market performance. There's interest rates, inflation, and corporate profits. So when you look at those three engines right now, it, it's not the worst thing you've ever seen. Interest rates, clearly bullish right now. Are they going to be going up? I'm in the camp that they're not going to be going up significantly anytime soon. I think that the Fed is very fearful of the economy. I think it's very fearful of, of raising the rates too quickly. Uh, I think there is somewhat of a mentality of trying to inflate our way out of these things. Um, so I don't, think I don't think interest rates are going to be a problem from the market standpoint. And the big factor on interest rates, other than obviously cost of capital for corporations, is really the attraction of alternative investments to stocks. That's really, you know, if you've got interest rates that are just dirt cheap, um, they make equities look a heck of a lot better. If you had interest rates are 5 or 6% on a treasury security, Stocks wouldn't look so attractive given the risk that stocks have. So I think interest rates are really net bullish. Inflation is one of those things, you know, 10 people could argue and five of them could say, boy, inflation's going to take off. And five could say, I don't think so, at least not for the next 12 months. I'm probably in the latter camp. Yeah, I know we're dumping money into the, market, into the, into the economy in a big way. 
Yeah, I know the dollar is just going to heck. Yeah, I know all those things. Gold is going up, all those things that would really point to inflation. And that may happen, but I don't think it's going to happen over the next 12 months. I don't think inflation is the real bogeyman here. And the thing that I'm not seeing that I usually need to see for me to get too fired up about inflation is really wage pressure, where you start really seeing wage inflation there. And I don't know about Pensacola, but I'm not seeing that up outside of Chicago. So I'm not too concerned about inflation. I know there are a lot of people that are. I know they can make really good cases why you should be, but I just don't think inflation is really what's going to short circuit this market. The third factor is corporate profits. And there, I think, could be the potential problem. Up to this point, though, and one of the reasons we've had this type of move is that corporate profits really over the last two or three quarters, they may look pretty nasty in an absolute basis. And when you're comparing them to the previous year, they don't look all that great. But Wall Street really isn't driven by absolutes. It's driven by expectations. And what you have seen are corporate profits, by and large, in the last two or three quarters, really beating expectations. Now, can it continue to do that? And that's the 64,000 hour question. You know, clearly we've gone from A to B here. Now, to get from B to C and back up here, what's it going to take? Well, one thing it's going to take is you're going to need to continue to see interest rates favorable. And I think that probably will be the case. You're going to need to continue to see inflation be reasonably under control. And I think that's going to be the case. I'm not so sure about corporate profits and the ability for corporations going forward to continue to beat expectations. You know, keep in mind, what were everybody's expectations down here? Yeah, they were zero, as I heard somebody say. You know, the hurdle wasn't real high to beat those expectations. So consequently, companies that were coming out and actually, you know, reporting profits and, oh my gosh, this, this company actually made money. True, it was down 90% from the year earlier, but we weren't expecting them to make money. And that's one of the things people need to keep in mind, too, when they look at stocks. I have so many people go, why is this market going up? It doesn't make any sense. It's over 10% unemployment. You know, we've, I know Joe down there. They just laid off another 25 people. Markets are anticipatory. They move on expectations. And they generally will reflect what starts to happen. You know, when this market started to move out here, it was long before we started to see really any clear evidence that the economy had even bottomed. But that's generally what markets do. And that's why you saw the markets move out here, because corporate profits in the last few quarters have managed to come in and beat earnings estimates pretty handily and pretty consistently. Now, the big question is, can they do it going forward? And I think that's where some of the trouble may come in for this market. You know, first and foremost, it was easy to beat expectations when they were down here. But what this does is really raise the bar on expectations now. People are starting to feel a little bit better. You've got animal spirits that are percolating again. You've got people that are willing to assume risk again. And those expectation levels are higher. Our company's going to have to continue to beat those expectations to jumpstart this market. Now, up to this point, I think corporate profits have been doing a pretty good job beating expectations on the back of cutting costs. And that's great, improving productivity by cutting costs. But that's a game you can only play for so long. At some point, you're going to need bona fide revenue growth. And I think that's what you're really going to need to get this thing to the next level. And I think that's where this market potentially could run into a little bit of problem in terms of corporate profits, bona fide revenue growth. Part of the mixture for bona fide revenue growth is having the consumer come back in and come back in in a stronger way. And I think that is subject to some issue, quite honestly. Have people's uh, spending changes fundamentally changed? Uh, have they really pulled in their reins and that's going to last? I still think you have job situations. Even people with job are looking at them fairly tenuously. They're not spending money. I think people that were at or near retirement or in retirement took a hit last year like they did. They've recalculated things. And I'm not sure the consumer is going to be coming back in the way corporations need it to, to drive those earnings to a higher level. So if somebody asks me, and again, this is one of these exercises, you know, Chuck, what can happen to drive this market down? You know, corporate profits would probably be my first, you know, my, my first thing. But the fact of the matter is a lot of times you never know that until after the fact. Again, the market's kind of anticipatory. But I think that's, that's probably the issue. So using the Dow theory, Dow theory says, okay, fine, we had this significant decline. The rally that we've had, there's some reasons why this rally makes sense, some fundamental reasons. 
But under the Dow theory, it says basically, you know, we're getting kind of long in the tooth on this rally in the short run, maybe 11,000. So that's one of the reasons we're a bit cautious on the market here as we go toward the end of the year and into, into uh, 2010. Another tool that we use to try to assess market risk, and it's the single best tool I have ever seen in 27 years of doing this, to give me a simple snapshot of the risk that an investor is taking in the market at any point in time, a relative risk. We call it the intermediate potential risk indicator. Now this looks like you know, a lot of people's EKGs last November, I'm sure. <laughs> Look like mine, too. This is a tool that has a real complicated sounding premise that's actually quite simple. This looks at one statistic and one statistic only. The percentage of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that trade above their 200-day moving average. The percentage of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that trade above their 200-day moving average. I'm a big fan of simple tools. Simple tools are easy for anybody to get the data, easy to implement, and easy to monitor. And it doesn't get much easier than this. And I'll tell you what this means exactly, why it's important, and how anybody in this room can track this on a daily basis for the price of a daily newspaper. I'm a believer in this concept of reversion to the mean. Reversion to the mean says basically, you know, in the short run, things can move to extremes. But over the long run, things tend to migrate toward an equilibrium level. And I usually give two examples. Human emotions. You know, think about your own human emotions. Marriages, funerals, births, deaths, you know, job loss, new jobs. Spikes, peaks, valleys of our emotions. But we don't live at those peaks and valleys, at least hopefully most of us don't live. Why? Well, it takes too much energy, okay? We'd be exhausted if we lived at those. So while that can happen in the short run, that energy dissipates, and we tend to live our lives at some equilibrium level, some golden mean, if you will. Now, I will grant you not everybody's equilibrium level is the same as everybody else's, but that's kind of where we live our life. Weather patterns, another example. I don't have to tell you about weather, right? Tropical storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms. Weather patterns can really spike in terms of uh, outliers, but we don't live at those outliers. Why? It takes too much energy. That energy over time dissipates. Weather assumes some sort of equilibrium range, some range. And I think there's an element of that in stock prices, too. And we've seen it time and again. You know, when you go back here, you know, this period here, tremendous amounts of energy were going on, selling energy driving stocks down and down and down to a really outlier position. Once that energy dissipated, we started to see kind of a, a reversal here, a reversion back to, a, to a, an equilibrium level, so to speak. Um, how do you evaluate, though, what the equilibrium level is, and how can you tell if things are really at extremes? This does a good job of it. A stock's 200-day moving average, I think, is a reasonable proxy for a stock's equilibrium range. Now granted, an equilibrium range on a stock doesn't have to be a straight line sideways. You can have something that tends to curl upward, and stocks over time tend to move upward, you know, 2008 notwithstanding. They tend to generally move upward. So a 200-day moving average for a stock is what? Well, you take 200 trading days, take the average price of those 200 days, and that's a point on the line. To get the next point, you drop a day, you add a day, you take the average, boom. Boom, boom. So when you're looking at a 200-day moving average on a stock, it's encompassing a pretty long period of time. And to me, that gives you a reasonable proxy. It's not perfect, but a reasonable proxy for a stock's equilibrium price range. So basically, this tool says, look, if you have lots and lots of stocks trading above their 200-day moving average, that means stocks are really popular. They're way above this equilibrium range, and at some point, you would expect them to start to migrate back down to the equilibrium level. Conversely, if you have lots and lots of stocks that are trading below their 200-day moving average, at some point you would expect that pressure to cease and they would start to trend back up to their equilibrium level. Well, my firm has been following this for 20 years, since 1989. And we've kind of quantified what lots and lots is on the upside and the downside. Higher risk tends to be 70% 
or more. In other words, when you have 70% or more of the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that are trading above this equilibrium level, stocks tend to be pretty risky, at least on a six-month time frame. And that's what we're kind of talking about, a six-month time frame here. Now, notice, you know, the second it gets in above 70%, 71%, you don't see this thing automatically go back down. And that's the case. Stocks can stay at extremes for a little bit. Weather patterns can stay at extremes for a little bit. They eventually dissipate. But they can stay in these higher risk areas. Usually, they will end up going down. You, you know, for example, here you've got... Uh, well, 2007 is when the market peaked in October. This peaked, looks like, in May, May, June period of that year. And yeah, the market did go a little bit higher in October, but eventually it wore out and you saw what happened. So again, it's best to use tools like this, not necessarily, you know, really finely with a scalpel, but almost kind of with a sledgehammer. And again, what, again, what we're trying to do is get some perspective on where we are in a market situation. So, going back when I came here last November, last November, it was November 20th, as a matter of fact. And November 20th turns out to be a pretty key day for this chart. This is November 20th. 1%, 1% of the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange were trading above their 200-day moving average on November 20th. That is the lowest, well, it's kind of an obvious statement, but that was the lowest that has ever been. It had never gotten below 10% prior to last year. And in fact, to give you some perspective, what happened here? Does anybody want to have a clue? That's right. It was 9-11. It got down to about 19% after 9-11. Now, if you remember what happened after 9-11, they shut the markets down for, what, three days? When they opened them, what happened? The market got crushed. Now... That would have been a pretty good time to buy some stocks, in hindsight. Now, I'm not saying it would have been the easiest time to buy stocks, but it would have been a pretty good time. Did you make money right away? No, you didn't. Because what happened? Well, the market crushed in late 2001. You had a little bit of a rally into early 2002. Then anybody remember what happened for the rest of 2002? It was bad. Market got crushed, and this is kind of a reflection of that when it got driven down to here. But then, at the end of 2002 into 2003, boom. And you had some volatility here. But you had pretty much a 03, 04, 05, 06, and into 07, pretty good market periods. So had you bought after 9-11 when you saw this well below into the 30%, well below the 40, 30% range, had you bought, you wouldn't have made money right away, but you probably would have been really glad you did buy 24 months later. If you bought here, obviously you would have been really glad that you did, given what's happened in the market since November. But again, keep in mind, what happened since November here? If you'd have bought here, you would have had a little market blip up in January, and then the market would have gone even below where it was here, and you would have been sitting there going, boy, I am an idiot. <laughs> but it would have been a nice thing then when it took off in March. So using this tool, where are we today? We've had a big move since March. Is the market real high based on this? Is it real low? Let's take a look. Hello. The highest this ever got was right here. It was a couple of weeks ago. It's 95% right here. It's the highest this indicator has ever gotten since we've been tracking it in 20 years. Right now, it's 90%. It was 90% as of the close of yesterday. So it might be down a little bit given the market. I think the market was down a little bit today, wasn't it? Yeah, so it might be down a little bit today. But what you've seen here is a tremendous, tremendous rebound in stocks, tremendous move above this equilibrium level. Now, does that mean tomorrow this thing's got to tank? Well, it got in here three, four, five weeks ago and it hasn't tanked yet. You know, I don't know. I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is, History tells me any time it's ever been anywhere near these levels, we've had a pretty good whack in the market, and it has been you know, on the sooner side rather than the later side. So this is what I'm looking at now. How am I reflecting this in what I'm doing in portfolios and portfolios for our clients? Well, 
One of the things I am not is an all or nothing market timer. I think, you know, as much as you can have evidence that tells you stocks clearly look to be a little stretched here in the short run, the fact of the matter is, you know, this is just an indicator, and this thing could be flat wrong. Okay? It's not perfect. So, if you're one of these people that is all or nothing, I can tell you what happened with these all or nothing people, especially ones last year that pulled everything out of the market in November. What happens is, it's really, really hard to get back in. Because two things happen. The market goes up, what do you do? Well, you don't get back in because the market's going up and you're going to wait for it to come back down. And if the market goes down further, what do you do? Well, you don't get back in because the market's going down. So consequently, you never get back in. And that's the problem with kind of that all or nothing market timing. It's very, very difficult. A, it's very, very difficult to do it and do it right and do it consistently. You might get lucky. It's kind of like the first time we're going to Las Vegas. For whatever reason, first time you go to Las Vegas and you know it's true, you know, you're Diamond Jim Brady, baby. You're winning and nobody knows why. The second time you go there, you get your head handed to you. That's kind of the way it is with market timing. You get lucky a time or two. But to do it in an aggressive way, all or nothing, is really a fool's errand, I think. Because you're, the times that you get it wrong, you get so far behind an eight ball in trying to catch up, it's very difficult to do. And that's one of the things that we avoid doing. So what we have done is said, listen, we've got the Dow theory kind of indicating that a peak in this market should be around 11,000. That's still a little bit more room, maybe 10% from where we are now. Yet I've got this other tool that says, you know, we're probably in an area here where if the market really pulled back dramatically, and, and what would be dramatically? I think a pullback of 1,500 points from where we are now is very possible, okay, very possible. Um, would that be the worst thing in the world? I, you know, nobody would want to see a pullback 1,500 points. Do I think those March lows have a chance of being approached at 6,500? I, I don't. But keep in mind, had, you told, had we had this in May of 08, and somebody would have said, do you think in May of 08 at 13,000 that in November I'd be looking at a Dow at 7,500? I would have told you you're crazy. Well, who would have been the crazy one? So what we're doing is saying, listen, let's try to make some adjustments at the margin of allocations. And that's something I think all of you need to think about. What is that perfect allocation for me, that allocation of stocks versus bonds versus cash? And obviously, it's going to be different for virtually everybody in this room. But once you've achieved that, what we are doing is saying, listen, in all equity portfolios, in other words, in a portfolio where we have the ability to go to 100% stocks, we're currently about 70 75% stocks right now. And we're applying that 25 to 30% proportionately across our accounts that aren't 100% stock. For example, if we have a portfolio where we, you know, we've created an investment objective with the individual and our maximum is 50% equity, we're backing that off 25 to 30% of that 50%. So those people are more like 35% to 40% equity. Now, if the market keeps going up, are we going to leave money on the table? Yes, we are. But we still have enough skin in the game, yet we still have money to buy if the market pulls back and stocks are more attractive. So that's kind of what, that's how we're translating all of what I'm talking about right now into some sort of action plan. Because, you know, this is all great and it's all theory, but at the end of the day, you've got to figure out what you're going to do with your money. You know, your 401k. I can tell you with my 401k, when the market got up to about 9,500 and got into about here, I pulled about 15% out of equities in my 401k and shifted it over to fixed income investments. Now, how do I look now? I don't look so smart, right? The Dow's at 10,200. So I missed out on 700 points. I'm okay with that. I still got plenty of skin in the game. If the market goes up, I'm not going to maybe do as much as the market, but it'll be okay. And if it pulls back, I have a little bit of a cushion there and some money to put back in at better prices. So that's kind of my recommendation right now with the money we're running, and that's something, you know, that's how you can kind of put all this into some perspective. If you have an all-equity portfolio, hold maybe 25 to 30% in cash fixed income investments right now. On the fixed income side, we are prefacing more short-term corporates, maybe to intermediate corporates. I don't think there's real easy money left in the bond market, especially on the high-yield side. You know, I think you buy high yields now for the reasons you usually buy high yields, i.e. the yield, and not that it's going to go up 25 or 30%. And again, we're staying a little bit more short intermediate term on the corporates. That's where we think the opportunities are. Um, 
Oh, by the way, this is where you can get this tool here. I'm glad I went to this. Every day in the newspaper Investor's Business Daily, they publish this statistic. On days Tuesday through Friday, it's on page B2, B as in boy 2. On that page, you're going to see a bunch of stock charts, and one of the charts is the NYSE composite. And every day, it's right where it is there. 90% of the New York stocks are above their 200-day moving average price line. On Monday, they make you chase it around the newspaper. Don't ask me why. By the way, I don't work for Investors Business Daily. They don't know I exist. I don't get any money for telling you this. But the reason I tell you this is it's the only place I've ever found that you can find this very easy without trying to calculate it yourself. So you can get it every day in Investors Business Daily. Most days of the week, it's on page B, uh, page B2. So now we can get, okay, you can wake up now. We're going to get to individual stocks. Um, my firm uses a tool called Quadrix to evaluate stocks, and it's our stock rating tool. Quadrix looks at more than 100 different variables for a company across six important categories, such as earnings estimates, value, momentum, price performance, financial strength, quality, et cetera. And what we do then, we're, Quadrix, our Quadrix universe is about 4,000 stocks. So we rank all stocks in that Quadrix universe one against the other, and we score them on an overall score, which is a maximum score of 100, 0 to 100, and then we also score them on the subcategory scores of value, earnings, momentum, et cetera. And this has been our primary tool, our, our, our model, that really buttresses our stock picking at our firm. And Quadrix has had a pretty good track record. This is not, by the way, a back-tested track record. This is real time showing how the various groups of stocks as ranked by Quadrix have performed since we started using Quadrix in real time beginning in the second quarter of 2000. And group one, this big blue shaded area, are stocks in Quadrix rated 80 and above. In other words, the top quintile performers in Quadrix. And, you know, it's almost embarrassing, actually, but it's really worked, you know, in lockstep. The group one stocks do better than the group two, who do better than group three, who do better than group four, and who do better than group five. And we use Quadrix, really, as our first and most important primary screen for looking at stocks. Some stocks that we are currently recommending right now that score extremely well in Quadrix and we feel offer some interesting opportunities. Uh, we have uh, pretty significant overweightings right now in both technology stocks as well as healthcare stocks. The healthcare may surprise some of you given what's going on in the healthcare world and the uncertainty with all those stocks. Our feeling there is, to some extent, there's an awful lot of bad news already baked into those stocks because of that uncertainty. Uh, I don't think we're going to see something as onerous um, of the health care reform for these companies that might come out. And therefore, I think there's going to be some opportunities in some of these stocks as there's more clarity brought to that. Also, health care stocks tend to be what's called defensive stocks, where they hold up generally better during downturns in the market. And I think if you kind of believe what I do, that we're in for a little bit of a pullback in the market, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have some health care stocks, too, Healthcare stocks that we like a great deal. One is Amerisource Bergen. Amerisource Bergen, the symbol is A, B is in boy, C. The company is a distributor of pharmaceuticals with a real bent toward generics that they distribute. I think if there's a winner in healthcare reform, I think there's going to be much more emphasis put on generics. They're in kind of a catbird seat there. The stock's trading for about $23. Stock that scores extremely well in Quadrix and one that we like a great deal. A second healthcare stock that we like is a company called Hospira, H-O-S-P-I-R-A, Hospira. The stock symbol is H-S-P as in Peter. Hospira is, uh, they're, they're kind of interesting. They do generic biopharmaceuticals, uh, particularly in the oncology area. They also have drug delivery systems. They do a tremendous amount of business internationally where generic biopharmaceuticals are happening versus in the United States. Um, and, and again, they are kind of in a catbird seat, too, in terms of strength in the generic area um, going forward. The stock trades are about $47. It scores very well in our Quadrix system. A couple other names that I want to give you. You know, one of the things that I do a lot of is focus on these programs called dividend reinvestment plans and direct purchase plans. And I write a newsletter on that. In a nutshell, these plans allow any investor in this room to buy stock directly from the company without a broker, and in many cases, for little or no fees. Uh, I think they're great plans. 
uh, not just for newcomers to the stock market, but they're great plans, and this may be more applicable for the people in this room, for people that are looking to kind of get a child or a grandchild started investing. And I, I gave this seminar, as Carol mentioned yesterday, and we had a lot of people there that were new to the market, but we also had people there that clearly had um, some children and grandchildren. And, you know, I tell them, you know, maybe we've already made the mistakes, and maybe we didn't get in the market soon enough, and we've done all that. But I can guarantee you, if you can get a young person started investing at a young age, you absolutely will change their life. You will change their life. And I go back and kind of fondly um, look at what could have happened when I turned the age of 13 and became a teenager if I would have set aside or my parents or grandparents would have set aside money for me. And I went back and looked. One of the first stocks I ever bought was ExxonMobil. And I just wish, when I turned 13 back in 1999, that I could have had ExxonMobil. Wait a minute, that's not right, is it? When I turned 13 in 1973, September 28th of 1973, I turned 13. Had I put $1,000 into Exxon stock, it'd be worth $144,000 today. That's by reinvesting dividends. That's not putting another penny in. And Exxon stock hasn't even been the most crazy stock I could have picked for that example. You know, put 10,000 in in 1973 when I was 13, I'd have a million four today in Exxon stock. The power of time is the biggest power you have in an investment program, and kids have that. And if you can do that, you can change your life. And I think these plans are really good about that. I'm going to blow through these four ideas here for you, and then I'll get to your questions. Four stocks that look interesting to me right now that have dividend reinvestment plans. One is a foreign company, which is one of the neat things you can buy foreign stocks this way. That company is Novo Nordisk. Does anybody know what Novo Nordisk does? That's right. I'm sure we probably have some people who use their product. They're the world's largest provider of diabetes treatment products. It's a Denmark-based company. NVO is the symbol, Nancy, Victor, Oscar. And you can buy their stock directly from the company. Minimum initial investment, I believe, is just $200. A couple other stocks in that technology area. I, th I like IBM. I think IBM does have legitimate revenue growth possibilities that can help the stock. IBM has a direct purchase plan. You can buy their stock directly. I think the minimum initial investment's $500. I also kind of like Microsoft. I'm always hesitant to mention Microsoft in kind of a technology place because nobody seems to like Microsoft, but I do right now. I think it's an interesting stock, and I think it's finally starting to get its act together. It's a $28. I think you're looking at about a $32 stock over the next 12 months. You can buy Microsoft stock directly, first share in every share. Minimum initial investment in Microsoft, I believe, is about $250. Um, one last one I'll mention is Kellogg. And Kellogg's kind of one of those neat companies, especially if you're trying to get your grandchild or child invested in it, because they have some skin in the, Oh, I know Kellogg. And I think that solidifies that whole educational process a lot. Kellogg's a good company. The neat thing about Kellogg is, in their direct purchase plan, anybody in this room can buy stock in Kellogg, buy it directly. Minimum initial investment is just $50. So instead of getting your kid that video game next year for Christmas, Buy him, buy him some Kellogg stock. Again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure coming back and speaking. Thank you. I can take a few questions uh, from people if you have any. Yes, sir. Uh, all I borrowed money comes from overseas. If a dollar de continues to deteriorate, uh, how much longer are people going to buy our treasuries? I'm, gl I'm glad you said that because you know when I did the exercise where I get nervous when there's such a consensus opinion of something and I asked who thought the market was going up and maybe half the people, who thinks the dollar is going to strengthen? I think, I think, and it's crazy, but I, I think, and it's going to happen, you know, if you, if you believe that the market is vulnerable. The, the, the dollar and the market have been pretty much, I mean, almost correlated inversely. And so if you think the market's going to pull back, the dollar's going to strengthen. So I think the dollar is probably, you know, between now and six months from now, I think the dollar could potentially be 15% to 20% higher than it is today. That makes me an incredible contrarian. But one of the reasons I am is exactly what I just saw here. I, you know, it is the most overthought trade right now 
from everybody, including people that you know don't know the difference between a dollar and a one and a rupee or, or whatever. You know, oh, the dollar's weak and the dollar's weak. I, I think you're going to see that start to change. Um, I could be wrong, but I, again, if that relationship stays the same, if the market pulls back, the dollar's going to start to strengthen. So I think that's what you're going to see. And I think you're going to see that sooner rather than later. Yes? being weak or strong doesn't seem to correlate with what happens with the market. I mean, haven't we seen the dollar devaluating, not destroying our markets, but more what Warren Buffett said, our own refusal to keep it in circulation plummeted us? Well, I, I, I mean, we certainly have had a nice market here when the market has been declining. Um, but we also still have a market, and, and I'm not saying we necessarily have to have this strong dollar, really strong dollar. And in fact, there's, there are a lot of multinational companies that hope and pray the dollar doesn't strengthen because their profits are going to get hammered. But I think there's a middle ground in there. Again, it's this notion of extremes. I, I think there's a confidence issue when you see the dollar doing what it's doing now. Um, but do you need a really, really strong dollar? I, I don't. I, I, I th and I think that's what you're going to end up with. I think the dollar... I think the pendulum has swung, and I think it's swung too far, and I think you're going to see it start to swing back into a zone that I think the markets you know, and foreign investors and people can live with. So, Yes, sir. Thank you for coming back. Will the Dow be twofold? Will the Dow be above 12,000 in the fourth quarter of next year? And will there be more or less mergers? Thanks. I think 12,000 might be a bit ambitious. Um, I'm looking more for maybe about a si sideways to maybe a 6% up next year. And, and that's after a pretty, a pretty good whack probably early in the year. Um, 12,000 is possible. I, I guess I'd be a little surprised if it got there, but it could. Um, your second question? There'll, there'll be more, for sure. I mean, I, you know, credit's loosening a little bit. You're, you're starting to see it already. Companies are starting to use, you know, they, now they have, they have a, cur a currency that has value again, i.e. their stock price. So, you know, I think you're going to start to see more stock deals done. So I think, I think merger activity will, will, will increase. That's a, uh, there's a ton of confidence involved in the merger game. And, and as, long, as long as you don't see a retest of those March lows of earlier this year, I think that confidence will be there. Yes, sir. Uh, our uh, political uh, situation is very conten uh, contentious. Uh, very, uh, uh, is it, there, there's a big doubt in, in uh, the cap and trade and the health care reform bill and so on and so forth. How, how much, and our deficits, how, how much will the, our political uh, situation occur uh, really affect the stock market? I, I think it's going to be very negative. I would agree. I think, you know, once you get past corporate profits, uh, the, the political spectrum uh, concerns me a great deal. Uh, you know, and this is, you know, these always sound front like a political statement, but the fact of the matter is, you know, markets don't like higher taxes on investments. And it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's math. And math says, listen, if you raise taxes on investments, you reduce after-tax returns. And if you're going to reduce after-tax returns, that asset value is going to adjust downward to reflect that. So if, in fact, tax policy... Is, is really how I, where I really look in terms of the political spectrum and how that can affect the markets. We've got the preferred tax rates on long-term gains and dividends expiring at the end of next year. What's going to happen to that? Um, is, is that going to not be extended? It looks like it won't be, um, but that's still you know, 14 months away and the political winds can change. But if you start to see taxes going up, layered on top of you know, an increase in the deficit, but even maybe more significantly, this continuing regulate, you're going to see more regulation, that's more cost of business, you're going to see the continuing kind of intervention and control. Um, and again, whether you think that's merited or not, I can tell you, bureaucracies move slower than private corporations. So you are going to clog up things, and slow is not necessarily better for the market and corporate profits. So to me, you get outside of corporate profits, the biggest risk in the market. I don't worry about recessions. We have, you know, we've had them all, go back in history, we have them all the time. We come out of them. But when you start really laying down significant things that can be hard to reverse going forward, i.e. political stuff, I think that's a huge risk. Yes, sir. One thing we didn't talk about tonight was the real 
the state. Okay. And one of the, of the areas, you, know, you talked about the different assets that started this whole thing down was uh, residential real estate than commercial real estate. And I've seen some interesting studies that said next year we're going to see the second phase of that as you have a whole bunch of other arms going to foreclosure. And that's going to affect this greatly. What do you think about the real estate market? You know, I, I, I am hardly a real estate expert by any means. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that market is still kind of probing for a bottom. I think you're going to start to see more activity next year in a positive way. But I think the notion of the, you know, the 5% the, the, the a year or 10% a year, that may never happen again, or at least in my lifetime. I think you're probably looking at things bottoming out next year. Not doing much in the way of upside next year, maybe not doing much in the way of upside the following year, um, because there's still a tremendous amount of, of uh, supply in the marketplace. And to work off that supply uh, is just going to take a while. And you have, yes, you have the, the vulture investing coming in now that kind of pumps up the sales numbers relative to where they were before, but in terms of real price appreciation, I, I, I'm not seeing that, nor am I banking on it for at least another 24 months. Um, yes. Yes, sir. If and when uh, inflation should flare up, what, what do you plan to do with your uh, client's money? Well, we'll probably look a little more. I think, I think like TIPS, for example, the Treasury, the Inflation Protected Instruments, I think are a little pricey right now because there is kind of an inflation mentality out there that I don't think. I would try to get some of those at better prices. Um, you know, it, it's tough. In an inflationary market, I mean, you know, if you get into serious inflation, I mean, I started in this business in 1982, and one of the reasons the Dow Jones Industrial Average was 770 at the time was you had inflation running at, 15% or whatever it was. And to try to run and hide at that point, you know, you can put all your money in cash. Inflation's going to eat you alive in cash. You know, there are dividend, dividend paying stocks that have the mechanism to grow those dividends and that provide at least some hedge against inflation. And we would probably look more seriously at those types of stocks that have, you know, like a, a company like a Johnson & Johnson, for example, that's raised dividends for 47 years that you would expect some further dividend growth and have some um, pricing power in, in that environment, and we would probably shift to that. Um, but again, I, you know, I'd be lying if I said I had the perfect solution to eliminate inflation, because you get into runaway inflation, I, you can put all your money in cash, and at least you're not going to lose it in the market, but the value of that obviously is going to go down too. So I would look at tips, try to buy those at better prices now, and then I would look at dividend-paying stocks that have a mechanism with that dividend growth. I'll take one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll take two. I'll, I'll take... I'll take two more. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, given your uh, attitude about the next couple of years, what will you be telling your clients who may have uh, 401k accounts? Uh, should they take advantage of the uh, 2010, 11, 12 capability to switch to a Roth uh, 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 because of your feelings about taxes? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Where you have this kind of window next year to be able to do that and and to pay and to pay the tax, you can do the shift to a Roth next year and then pay the taxes over 11 and 12. Um, I think it makes sense as long as you're not paying the tax out of the money that you pull out and put in, into, into the Roth, that you're, you're letting that money still grow. And that may be easier said than done, depending on how much money that you're pulling out of the one you're going to have to pay tax on. But where, where it works best is that you're not really destroying that money you're pulling out to pay the tax. And that's not, again, for a lot of people, that's not easy. But if you can do that, I think it does make some sense. I'll take one. Yes, sir. Are, are you looking for a couple of events to occur before the companies that, that greatly reduced their dividends before they start reinstituting them? Y yes. One of them is, you know, paying back the TARP money. Um, but I think even for some of those companies that have, you know, the, the, I think it's going to be a little slower for those companies because I think there, you know, I think there's an awful lot of people, you know, in banking and whatever in those businesses where they were hurt that they don't want to get back into that trick bag again of offering a dividend and then having a cut because I think there's still a lot of uncertainty of what there's floating around on their balance sheets, quite honestly, and I think they know that. And, you know, when you look at the banks, the big banks that have done well from a profit standpoint, a lot of them have made their money so far this year on trading profits 
on their investment banking side and, and things like that. And, and the, you know, the, the, the pure banking business is still pretty tough. And um, so I'm not optimistic that you're going to see a stock like a Bank of America start to pay a big dividend again. You know, the one that may, you may start to see their dividend increase and in probably early next year of those companies, and they have paid back TARP is J.P. Morgan. But some of the other ones, I'm not real convinced you're going to uh, see that anytime soon, at least in the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you again, everybody, for coming out. I appreciate it.